Mohamed Yunus, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Uh, we're going to talk about your new book, A World of Three Zeros, in a moment, but I have to start talking with you about perhaps the biggest story in the world right now in many ways, because you are one of a select band of individuals who have been honored with a Nobel Peace Prize, and yet one of your fellow Nobel Peace laureates, Aung San Suu Kyi, currently seems to be complicit in brutal violence, ethnic cleansing, possibly genocide against a Rohingya Muslim minority in Myanmar. How does that make you feel? I feel terrible. It's the most shameful thing, terrible thing that happened. To me, it's the number one news item right now. And I feel it every day because the people are coming. I'm from the same region where the uh, Rohingya people are coming in, Chirigang. Yeah. Um, I feel this uh, Nobel Peace Prize that she got, she had one image, whole world showered with admiration and respect for her. Now she could completely reverse her position. She has another face, which is about atrocities, about killing her own citizens. These Rohingyas were born there, lived there for generations. Mm. And they, when the country became independent, they were automatically became the citizens. They participated in politics. They sent their representatives in the parliament. They were the cabinet members. Suddenly, in 1982, military government comes with the idea. Stripping are, them of rights. Yeah. Stripping them of rights. They are no longer citizens. So let me ask you this. In Myanmar right now, what we're seeing uh, is what the UN has called a textbook example of ethnic cleansing. Last year, you signed a letter to the UN Security Council with a dozen other Nobel laureates expressing, quote, frustration at Aung San Suu Kyi for her refusal to act on this issue. Just to be clear, because a lot of people kind of point the blame in different directions, how much blame do you place on her directly for the current crisis, for this ongoing violence and refugee movement? I'll put 100% of the blame on her because she is the leader. Hmm. She can say that the army is pushing me or somebody... A lot of people would say the military are really in charge. What sure. can she do? Well, then she should resign. This is, they can't handle it because this is their own citizen. It's not a few people. So by staying on, she's blessing the military Absolutely. operation. Blessing. And not around it there. Verbally, she's defending it. Yeah. She says, I don't know why these people are going. No, we don't have atrocity. No, it is our economies who are attacking us. All kinds of things. There is no atrocities in uh, villages, burning of villages. These are all false. She made that mm. statement. These are all false news. So she takes all the blame herself. So there's no way you can part it with the military and anybody else. She gets all the blame and she's responsible for it and she has to fix it. So when your fellow uh, Nobel Peace Laureate, Jose Ramos Orto of East Timor, who signed that letter with you last year, That's right. but a few months ago he was on this show and he was basically defending Aung San Suu Kyi. He said she's handling a very complex, delicate situation. She cannot antagonize the military. Quote, criticism probably is misdirected more to her than to the military. What do you say to him? I'll say the same thing. I mean, if she, is, if, if she cannot say the things she should say, then she's no leader. Leader is supposed to stand by their own people. Have you had any contact with Aung San Suu Kyi yourself in recent months? I met her several times before, not before this incident, before the election. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned about Rohingyas and so on. She said, well, I have to be very careful about the military. I cannot say anything. Okay, but when the that. election is over, if I'm the winner, I'm definitely taking a stand in favor. Oh, she said the, that to you? She said that to me. Oh, wow, so yeah. she's gone so back on that in your absolutely. view. Absolutely. And, and if you could speak to her directly today, what would you say to her? What should she be doing? I said, you have to, st you should have to stand up. You have to protect your image that you built over years as a defender of human rights, a defender of democracy. What happened to all those battles? Lose that you have promoted. Mm. Stand by them. It's not the military, it's not somebody else. You suffered the house arrest and all this for years and years. You believed on some principles. What happened to those principles? Is it because just you want to stay in power? You have to def go along with military and everybody else? What would they do? They will put you back into prison or something like that. Do you think she still deserves that Nobel Peace Prize? Uh, if, she's, if she had all this story in front of the uh, committee, I'm sure committee will never give her the. Um, just talking about your own country, Bangladesh, which is hosting one million Rohingya refugees who have fled persecution in Myanmar, I think more than half a million oh, just really? since August yeah. alone. Yeah. Uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has been commended by a lot of people in the international community for taking in the refugees, for speaking on behalf of refugees. But let's be honest, Bangladesh is a poor country with a bunch of domestic problems that need tackling. How long can it continue to host this growing Rohingya refugee population within its, its borders? It's not only simply economic issue. It's a political issue, yeah. it's a security issue. So you have one million people who belong to another country, came to your country, and they're already taking up arms against their uh, situation. And it becomes the den of all the terrorist activities very soon. And all the international connections of the terrorism will begin, and this will be 
terrible for Bangladesh and terrible for the region. And all these things will come, come on in an explosive way as mm. days go by. So I'm saying that it has to be resolved fa very fast before all those elements can be active and create trouble for everybody. Okay. Um, many are concerned that in Bangladesh, uh, hifazat -e islam a quote-unquote Islamist pressure group in Bangladesh, is exploiting the influx of Rohingya refugees. They're organizing mass protests around the issue. Uh, they're even uh, threatening to wage jihad against Myanmar if, quote, the army doesn't stop torturing Muslims. How worried are you that groups Groups like Hifaza are getting a big PR boost in Bangladesh from the Rohingya crisis and becoming even more influential in what was once traditionally deemed to be a secular democracy, not an Islamist country. Uh, this issue, uh, the Rohingyas and the refugees, uh, will become the fodder for all kinds of negative activities, yeah. including the extreme on the terrorism. So these are only demonstrations. I'm worried about the terrorism that it will breed because of the frustrations in the young people. We are not seeing the young people yet, but when they came, mostly were women and children. These children will grow up. Who is giving them the education? Who is going to the future? What is the future they look up to? So they will be very ready you to... You believe go. the Rohingya refugee crisis is a recruiting sergeant, in a sense, for the... Absolutely. ISIL, I would say it is a, it's a uh, concentrated hub for re uh, recruitment and promotion of uh, terrorism. And just one last question on this issue. On Bangladesh and on Myanmar, Sheikh Hasina has said that Myanmar has pretended like they wanted a war. Uh, the Bangladeshi government have accused Myanmar drones and choppers of violating its airspace. Are you worried that this conflict could erupt into an outright open war between that's, the two countries? That is a regional security issue right now. Which direction it will take, we don't know. Because if the, in the name of Rohingya, something will happen. Somebody will use the Rohingya name yeah. to make it happen. So any direction it can go. It's not only between, Rohingya, between Bangladesh and Myanmar. I'm saying all the regional countries will become involved in it. India will get involved with it. Pakistan will get involved with it. All the terrorist groups will involve with Middle East and so on. How many countries will get involved? God knows. Because this is a very attractive uh, thriving mm. uh, area, staging area for the terrorist activities. Uh, Mohammed Yunus, let's talk about your new book, A World of Three Zeros, The New Economics of Zero Poverty, Zero Unemployment and Zero uh, Net Carbon Emissions. It's focused on uh, capitalism, in particular unfettered capitalism and growing wealth inequality around the world. You write in the book that the structure of the present economic system is, quote, a ticking time bomb waiting to destroy everything we have created over the years. What do you mean by that exactly? Well, very simple thing, that uh, the way the concentration of wealth is taking place in the world, uh, it is just leading to the ticking time bomb, any day to explode. Today, eight people in the world own more wealth than the bottom half of the entire world's population. And tomorrow, it will be one person will be owning half the population's w worth of wealth into, in the hand of one. And day after, probably one person will own 85% of the wealth of the entire world. This is the direction. It will not far-flung uh, time mm. period. It's just about next few years it will happen. So a lot of people who read your book or listen to you speak now, especially on the right, will say, look, there is a problem with wealth inequality, income inequality, but you're not looking at the big picture, which is the growth in incomes across the board. Uh, you acknowledge in the book that since 1990, global extreme poverty has been cut in half. If you look at China, for example, that's had a, a lot to do with economic growth. Um, 800 million people have been lifted out of poverty poverty there since 1980. That's a kind of capitalism too. Yeah, it is capitalism. It is capitalism which is helping people get out of poverty in a slow motion way again. Uh, but when you talk about the growth, growth of the economy, I'm not concerned about the growth of the economy. I'm concerned with the growth of people. So what do you say to people who read your book and say, but you're deliberately vague about A, how you switch to this new system of yours, and B, how your system would actually lead to zero poverty and zero unemployment? Those are big goals. Yeah, I mentioned that because I'm saying every business should have a parallel business of social business. And this is because we have it, not because I'm imposing on it. If you feel that, yes, you want to contribute, you want to play a part in solving Solving problems of unemployment, problem yeah. solving of the housing, healthcare, and so on and so forth, all the things that we know. Yeah, yeah. If you can play that, everyone doing that, this problem will be solved at the same time. Wealth sounds, concentration. But, but you know, you're not the first to say that. It sounds very utopian. You talk in the book about super happiness. Mm -hmm. We need to taste super happiness. And great in theory, but how do you do it in the real world? What yeah, makes the, your the full sentence is making money is a happiness, making other people happy is a super happiness. Okay, but again, very yeah. vague. These but, are not economic no, it's not, concepts. It's, it's not a big. It is vague. Say, you can't measure stuff. 
stuff like no, that. No, no, I understand. I, I keep telling when people say, oh, I don't feel super happiness. I, I said, because you have not done that. I said, why didn't you just try? And instead of saying the food that in front of you. OK, but that that's is, a very micro so approach, telling individuals to be happy. It's almost like a self-help. Systemic, yours is a systemic critique of capitalism. Do you have a systemic replacement and a way to get there? No. Systemic replacement is there will be two kinds of business. Yep. It's your choice. Capitalist system is all about choice. That's what they pride about. We are choice. But when it comes to business, there is no choice. Only you have model. to make money. You have to make a profit. You have to maximize profit. I said, that's not an option. You give people option. Let them choose okay. whether they want to do that, make profit maximization, or change the world by creating social business, okay. addressing the problem. You have not even addressed that issue. You say in your book that people without a future get angry at that desperately poor people will be driven to crime. Would you extend that analogy uh, about marginalized angry people turning to crime to the debate over radicalization? Um, is that what's also driving young people, especially young men in places like Bangladesh, into, groups, into the arms of groups like ISIL, in your view? If the wealth concentration continues the way it does, it will generate tremendous amount of anger in the mm -hmm. bottom most people. It will come out in politics, it will come out in social interactions, it will come out in economics. And I gave the example, probably Brexit is an example of that. Uh, they are blaming the others for taking away mm -hmm. their job, their income, and so on. And politicians use this kind of feeling and say, yes, you vote for us, we will stop uh, but, that immigra immigration, but, come out of the Euro European Union. But just specifically on the issue of radicalization, do you believe these socioeconomic trends and pressures are feeding into the radicalization? Anger narrative? goes in all directions. Mm. Uh, radicalization is a part of that. So if you're angry, you do all kinds of things. So logic doesn't guide you anymore. Not only in Brexit, I said, even in the US election, same thing happened. The people at the bottom got very angry with the system. They protested yeah. against it. In German election, recently. Yeah. The people who were never expected to be in the parliament, they got 13% of the seats. Yeah. I said these are probably the reaction generated at the bottom because they are frustrated, they are angry because they see the system is not working for them. Yeah. I said it will become worse and worse. Mohammed Yunus, thank you for joining me on Upfront. Thank you. Thanks thank so you. very much. Thanks, Thanks a lot.